Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and our only authority for truth. Well, friends, it is such a blessing and joy to be back with you again, and we're going to continue our look, our review on the book, Love Not the World by Watchman Nee. Now, today we find ourselves in chapter four, and as we noticed from last week, as with any person that we read, that we listen to, or even that we talk with and communicate with, we don't necessarily agree with everything they say because all of us are wrong and all of us are right in different areas. We certainly want to listen to one another, to learn from one another, iron sharpens iron. So we want to hear the thoughts of others and maybe how they see a, view, a certain topic or how they view a certain passage. And at least we want to consider that because we may be wrong in that area. And so they may enlighten us. But last week we saw that Watchman Nee leans heavily upon the idea that one must be baptized with water in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. But as I presented, if that's the case, then entry into heaven is at least in some way based upon a work or our work. But we know the Bible tells us very clearly that we are not saved by works, lest any man should boast upon or about those works. So we stand in the faith of what Jesus did for us and only by his mercy and his grace are our sins forgiven and will we be accepted in and invited in to the kingdom of heaven. So there will be times as we review Watchman Nee, both in this book and the book to come, The Spiritual Man, that we're probably not going to see eye to eye with everything he says. What I hope to do is to present both sides of the argument to you so you have as much information as possible to consider what is being presented and then come to your own conclusions based upon what you have heard. Well, with that being said, let's jump right into chapter four, which is titled Crucified Unto Me. Again, Watchman Nee, the book, Love Not the World. Separation to God, separation from the world is the first principle of Christian living. John, in his revelation of Jesus Christ, was shown two irreconcilable extremes two worlds that morally were poles apart. He was first carried away in the spirit into a wilderness to see Babylon, mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. You will find this in Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. Then he, John, was carried away in the same spirit to a great and high mountain, whence to view Jerusalem, the bride, the lamb's wife, You'll find this in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10. The contrast is clear and could hardly be more explicitly stated. Whether we be a Moses, a righteous person, or a Balaam, a pagan person, in order to have God's view of things, we must be taken like John to a mountaintop. Many cannot see God's eternal plan, or if they see it, they understand it only as dry-as-dust doctrine, and they are content to stay on the plains. For understanding never moves us. Only revelation does that. From the wilderness, we may see something of Babylon, but we need spiritual revelation to see God's new Jerusalem. See it once, and we shall never be the same. As Christians, therefore, we bank everything on that opening of the eyes. But to experience it, we must be prepared to forsake the common levels and climb. The harlot Babylon is always the great city. See Revelation chapter 16, verse 19, for example, with the emphasis on her attainment of greatness. The bride, Jerusalem, is by contrast the holy city, 
See Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and verse 10. She is the holy city with the accent correspondingly on her separation to God. She is from God and is prepared for her husband. For this reason, she possesses the glory of God. This is a matter of experience for us all. Holiness in us is what is of God, what is completely set apart to Christ. It follows the rule that only what originated in heaven returns there, for nothing else is holy. Let go this principle of holiness, and we are instantly in Babylon. Thus, it comes about that the wall is the first feature John mentions in his description of the city itself. There are gates, making provision for the goings of God. But the wall takes precedence. For, I repeat, separation is the first principle of Christian living. If God wants his city with its measurements and its glory in that day, then we must build that wall in human hearts now. This means in practice that we must guard as precious all that is of God and refuse and reject all that is of Babylon. I do not imply by this a separation between Christians. We dare not exclude our brethren themselves, even when we cannot take part in some of the things they do. No, we must love and receive our fellow Christians, but we must be uncompromising in our separation from the world in principle. Nehemiah in his day succeeded in rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, but only in the face of great opposition, for Satan hates distinctiveness. Separation of men to God he cannot abide. Nehemiah and his colleagues armed themselves. Therefore, and thus equipped for war, they laid stone to stone. This is the price of holiness we must be prepared for. For to build, we certainly must. Eden was a garden without artificial wall to keep foes out. So Satan had entry. God intended that Adam and Eve should guard it. They themselves constituting a moral barrier to him. Today, through Christ, God plants in the heart of his redeemed people an Eden to which, in triumphant fact, Satan will at last have no moral access whatsoever. We are told in Revelation chapter 21 verse 27, there shall in no wise enter into it anything unclean, or he that maketh an abomination and a lie, but only they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Most of us would agree that to the Apostle Paul was given a special revelation of the church of God. In a similar way, we feel that God gave to John a special understanding of the nature of the world. Cosmos is, in fact, peculiarly John's word. The other Gospels use it only 15 times, Matthew 9, Mark and Luke three times each, while Paul has it 47 times in eight letters. But John uses it 105 times in all, 78 in his gospel, 24 in his epistles, and a further three in the Revelation. In his first epistle, John writes, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You'll find this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. In these words that so clearly reflect the temptation of Eve, John defines the things of the world. All that can be included under lust or primitive desire, all that excites greedy ambition, and all that arouses in us the pride or glamour of life, all such things are part of the satanic system. 
Perhaps we scarcely need stay here to consider further the first two of these. But let us look for a moment at the third. Everything that stirs pride in us is of the world. Prominence, wealth, achievement. These are the things the world acclaims. Men are justly proud of success. Yet John labels all that brings this sense of success as of this world. Every success, therefore, that we experience, and I'm not suggesting that we should be failures, but every success that we experience calls in us for an instant humble confession of its inherent sinfulness. For whenever we meet success, we have in some degree touched the world system. Whenever we sense complacency over some achievement, we may know at once that we have touched the world. We may know too that we have brought ourselves under the judgment of God. For have we not already agreed that the whole world is under his judgment? And so now let us try to grasp this fact. Those who realize this and confess their need are thereby safeguarded. But the trouble is, how many of us are aware of it? Even those of us who live our lives in the seclusion of our own private homes are just as prone to fall prey to the pride of life, even as much as those who have great public successes. A woman in a humble kitchen can touch the world and its complacency even while cooking the daily meal or entertaining guests. Every glory that is not glory to God is vain glory. And it is amazing what paltry successes can produce vain glory. Wherever we meet pride, we meet the world. And there is an immediate leakage in our fellowship with God. Oh, that God would open our eyes to see clearly what the world is. Not only evil things, but all those things that draw us ever so gently away from God. These are units of that system that is antagonistic to him. Satisfaction in the achievement of some legitimate piece of work has the power to come instantly between us and God himself. For if it is the pride of life and not the praise of God that is awoke within us, we can know for certain that we have touched the world. There is thus a constant need for us to watch and to pray if we are to maintain our communion with God unsullied. What then is the way of escape from this snare which the devil has set to catch God's people? First, let me say emphatically that it is not to be found by our running away. Many think we can escape the world by seeking to abstain from the things of the world. Let me repeat that. Many people, many Christians, think that we can escape the world by seeking to abstain from the things of the world. That is folly. How could we ever escape the world system by using what, after all, are little more than worldly methods? Let me remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. When he said, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say about him, he has a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say about him, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Now some think that John the Baptist here offers us a recipe for escape from the world, by neither eating nor drinking. But neither eating nor drinking is not Christianity. Christ came both eating and drinking, and that is Christianity. The Apostle Paul speaks of the elements of the world, and he defines these as handle not, nor taste, nor touch. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. So abstinence is merely worldly, and no more. Let me read that again. 
abstinence is merely worldly and no more. Now, let me note here, what Watchman Nee is basically saying that there are many of us, me included at times, who stand upon a life of abstinence. So we say that we should get rid of our televisions. We should remove ourselves from the internet, from social media, and from other things that would cause us to appear to be touching the things of the world. But what Watchman Nee is saying here is that it's okay to have a television. We should discipline ourselves what to watch and what not to watch. Simply abstaining from television as a whole is a worldly aspect. But exercising discipline on how we use the things that God has entrusted us with, whether that be the internet, the television, the radio, or other means and devices that this world offers us, we are to exercise discipline on how we use these things. For it is truly far easier to throw our TV out the door rather than sit and watch a television, but discipline ourselves in what it is we're going to view and what it is we're not going to view. The discipline is a higher act of service than total abstinence itself. That's what Watchman Nee is communicating. That's what I would have to agree with. And that's what I would sometimes have to correct myself because I too have stood on the side of total abstinence at times rather than the principle of being able to discipline ourselves in how we use the things that we use. Well, let's continue with Watchman Nee. He says, how many earnest Christians are forsaking all sorts of worldly pleasures in the hope thereby of being delivered out of the world. You can build yourself a hermit's hut in some remote spot and think to escape the world by retiring there. But the world will follow you even as far as that. It will dog your footsteps and find you out no matter where you hide. Our deliverance from the world begins not with our giving up this or that, but with our seeing, as with God's eyes, that it is a world under sentence of death, as in the figure with which we open this chapter. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, John says in Revelation 18.2. Now a sentence of death is always passed, not on the dead, but on the living. And in one sense, the world is a living force today relentlessly pursuing and seeking out its subjects. But while it is true that when sentence is pronounced, death lies still in the future, it is nevertheless certain. A person under sentence of death has no future beyond the confines of a condemned cell. Likewise, the world being under sentence has no future. The world system has not yet been wound up, as we say, and terminated by God. But the winding up is a settled matter. It makes all the difference to us that we see this. Some folk see deliverance from the world in asceticism. And like the Baptist, John the Baptist specifically, they neither eat nor drink. That today, friends, is called Buddhism, not Christianity. As Christians, we both eat and drink, but we do so in the realization that eating and drinking belong to the world and with it are under the death sentence, so they have no grip on us. Let us suppose that the municipal authorities of the city that you live in should decree that the place where you are employed must be closed. As soon as you hear this news, you realize there is no future for you at that place. You go on working there for a period, but you do not build up anything for the future there. Your attitude to your place of work changes the instant you hear that it must close down. Or, to use another illustration, suppose the government decides to close a certain bank. Will you hasten to deposit in it a large sum of money in order to save the bank from collapse? No, not a cent more do you pay into it once you hear it has no future. You put nothing in because you expect nothing from it. 
and we may justly say of the world that it is under a decree of closure. Babylon fell when her champions made war with the Lamb, and when by his death and resurrection he overcame them. He who is Lord of lords and King of kings. There is no future for her. A revelation of the cross of Christ involves for us the discovery of this fact, that through it everything belonging to the world is under sentence of death. Now, we still go on living in the world and using the things of the world, but we build no future with them, for the cross has shattered all our hope in them. The cross of our Lord Jesus, we may truly say, has ruined our prospects in the world. We have nothing to live for there. There is no true way of salvation from the world that does not start from such a revelation. We need only try to escape the world by running away from it to discover how much we love it and how much it loves us. We may flee where we will to avoid it, but it will assuredly track us down. But we inevitably lose all interest in the world, and it loses its grip on us as soon as it dawns upon us that the world is doomed. To see that, is to be severed automatically from Satan's entire economy. At the end of his letter to the Galatians, Paul stated this very clearly when he said, Far be it from me to glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world hath been crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. Did you notice something striking about this verse? In relation to the world, it speaks of the two aspects of the work of the cross already hinted at in our last chapter. It says, I have been crucified unto the world. And this is a statement which we find fairly easy to fit into our understanding of being crucified with Christ as defined in such passages as Romans chapter 6. But here, it specifically says, too, that the world has been crucified to me. When God comes to you and me with the revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ, he not only shows us ourselves there on the cross, he shows us our world there, too. If you and I cannot escape the judgment of the cross, then neither can the world escape the judgment of the cross. Have we really seen this truth? Well, that is the question. When we see it, then we do not try to repudiate a world that we love. We see that it is the cross that has repudiated it. We do not try to escape a world that clings to us, but we see that by the cross, we have escaped. Like so much else in the Christian life, the way of deliverance out of the world comes as a surprise to most of us, for it is so at odds with all of man's natural concepts. Man seeks to solve the problem of the world by removing himself physically from what he regards as the danger zone. But physical separation does not bring about spiritual separation. Let me repeat that. Physical separation does not bring about spiritual separation. And the reverse is also true, that physical contact with the world does not necessitate spiritual capture by the world. Spiritual bondage to the world is a fruit of spiritual blindness, and deliverance is the outcome of having our eyes opened. However close our touch with the world may be outwardly, We are released from its power when we truly see its nature. The essential character of the world is satanic. It is at enmity with God. To see this is to find deliverance. So let me ask you as we close this chapter, what is your occupation of work? A merchant? A doctor? A teacher? An engineer? or a construction worker, do not run away from these callings. Simply write down, 
trade is under the sentence of death. Write down, medicine is under the sentence of death. Write down, education is under the sentence of death. If you do that in truth, life will be changed for you hereafter. In the midst of a world under judgment for its hostility to God, you will know what it is to live as one who truly loves and fears him. And that brings us to the end of chapter four today, friends. And there's some very important truth that Watchman Nee is touching on. And I think that we could simplify it by saying many times when we separate ourselves absolutely from the things of this world, we take pride. We, we boast in the things that we have done for God. But it appears through the writing of scripture that it is a greater virtue as a follower of the Lord Jesus to live in the world, but not of the world. Well, I love you, friends. I'm once again so grateful and blessed that you are hungry for the truth of God, and that brings you to this study today. I pray that your eyes are being opened and that you're being changed and becoming a more faithful follower to our Lord Jesus each and every day. Now, as he wills, and until next time, I so truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.